episode of the Mama Yaya Show. If you're watching us on Facebook, thank you. On YouTube, thank you. Whether you also listen to us on Spotify or Apple Podcasts, we thank you very much. To today's episode, I'm I'm having a conversation with Margaret McPherson on her book Tracking the Caribou Queen. Tracking the Caribou Queen, a memoir of a set a settler girlhood here in Canada. Margaret, welcome to the Nanaya Boy Show. Well, thank you very much for having me. Pleasure. Well, I discovered your book, you know, going through Instagram and reading a blip and getting more interested in the narrative of the settler girl in a girlhood in Canada. And I must say that your book brings to me a different perspective of you know how you grew up in particular so this is your memoir that's right so that is your voice your narrative your experiences but the, the first question i want to ask you is why the title tracking the caribou queen um the caribou queen if you've read the book you'll realize the caribou queen is a combination of uh it's a person it's a spirit it's sort of a um it's basically a combination of stereotypes and um uh, i wanted to dispel in my own mind some of those stereotypes and really look at where they came from in my life and what or who the caribou queen is or was um in 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 a in a in a way when i was very young i thought she was a person and then i realized that she was a mythology um and i had to but i wanted to call it tracking the caribou queen because there's nothing definitive about this work i'm not trying to tell people how to think or to come to any um conclusions Mm -hmm. i'm attempting to lay out my own understanding of um, looking at those very damning stereotypes that inform a lot of uh, white Canadians, particularly around um, uh, ways we perceive Indigenous people or ways we did perceive Indigenous people. And those stereotypes are, you know, there's two basic ones and they're equally damning and they're they're very even hard to say aloud, but they're the the idea of sort of the drunken Indian. Yes. And then on the other side, there's this other stereotype of the noble savage, you know, who's yes. totally in tune with the spiritual world. Both those stereotypes um, for me as a, as a child coming up were competing in my mind. And I was trying to discern and understand um, how those stereotypes uh, infiltrated my thinking and how I could deconstruct them and sort of decolonize my own mind because um, the narrative basically uh, covers my years from basically the age of consciousness and understanding about three, three and a half to um, 17 years old, just before I left my home place which was in the northwest territories Mm -hmm. and in the northwest territories i was in the northwest territories for those first 17 years of my life and because of my upbringing i think um i i took on the 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 moors and the um the, the, these stereotypes that were swirling around like the northern lights mm-hmm. uh swirling around me and they you know you as a child uh it's very important that you realize that this book is it's a girlhood so it it yes. it is a child who is unreliable who finds the world confusing and uh, i was a very sensitive child and that mm-hmm. confusion and that sort of this idea of who is the caribou queen what is she how can i become her because in my mind she was both you know both these stereotypes and i in some ways i i disdained her and in other ways i admired her and i was really trying to so so 
tracking her and really tracking the stereotypes is the deconstruction of uh, colonial thinking and um, trying um, through through narrative and through story to understand um, my own prejudices and also the system that enabled those prejudices. It's really important for me to look at racism as a systemic problem, but I wanted to keep the narrative entirely in that little, in that young girl perspective, because yeah. I could be true to my own voice that way and not mm -hmm. appropriate or usurp any other voices. So yeah. the Caribou Queen turns out to be, as you read the narrative, you understand that she she is many things and she is almost more a figment of the imagination yeah, yeah than anything else. But it's, um, you know, a very good friend of mine, uh, an elder, um, told me that the act of writing a memoir is going back to that confused child hmm. and and rescuing the child bringing them to a place of safety wow. and unpacking sort of all that confusion of childhood because you you have no voice and you have no um you have no sort of autonomy or agency when you're a child and yes. She said the act of, of memoir, the act of this particular memoir is bringing the young me to a place of safety and unpacking my own life so that I can be in a safe place and I can understand more clearly um, where my own prejudices came from. And and actually by by illuminating them, I can free myself of them. So you know, that's sort of my hope in this in this book. I already told you the book is deep, but this is deeper. <laughs> yeah. And let, let me tell you, it is it is refreshing because I I wouldn't say I've had the opportunity to interview a lot of indigenous people, uh, maybe two. Um, um, the author of um, uh, what's the title of the book? Uh, oh, something, something memory, memory keeper, Don Cheryl Hill, and um, the other uh, author, January um, Mary Rogers. And they are be both beautiful writers, all from here. Um, how do you call it? Uh, Brantford. Okay. Yes, all from Brantford. And um, I actually met January at the residential school which is closed. I went there trying to find some information and that's how I met her. And she is also a publisher of Ojin Tosh uh, Publishing. So she published Dawn's uh, also memoir, Memory Keeper. And it's like, so I, I have read and seen, seen from that aspect of writing that you know the notion of or the feeling of going through colonialism residential yeah. school that impact as an as a black immigrant woman here or african canadian yes yeah. so i need to situate myself african canadian but immigrant not born here yes. yes yes so i already came to canada saw indigenous people and white people and there were biases there were biases right through university. It was when I took it upon myself to start digging more, listen more to stories and everything that I, those biases as an immigrant, just like you said, started decolonizing my mind as well, because I realized that I came from a colony. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Started decolonizing, understanding the indigenous journey. So when your book came through and I read, it's like, okay, the settler girlhood had, ex um, you interacted with uh, indigenous people in Canada. This is where, what you were going through, you are unpacking, you are telling a narrative that I have never heard of. Yeah, it's, um, it was a very difficult book to write. Um, mostly because of um, 
I'll, I'll just back up a little bit. I grew up in the Northwest Territories in Yellowknife yeah, um, yeah. during the 60s and 70s. So I'm 60 years old myself. Um, and we grew up alongside Indigenous people, but um, it, it wasn't until I was, you know, in the last 12, 15, 10, 15 years that I really began to consider um, my own privilege and my own whiteness. And, um, you know, I started, uh, before I moved to Ontario, I lived in Edmonton and I started attending um, the Truth and Recon I attended the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And I started to really listen, as you, you mentioned, yeah. Lana, really listen to some of those narratives those those trauma narratives you know yeah. about residential school and 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 i also went to the um i attended the inquiry into murdered and missing indigenous women because yeah. of course in edmonton which is also quite far north not as far north as Yellowknife, but you know in those northern communities there was there's the highway of tears and there's a legacy yeah. of tragedy there and and tragedy that is very close to home because I was a girl who hitchhiked from Edmonton to Yellowknife. I was one of those girls on the highway. Wow. Um, but, but I started to really reflect on, um, you know, my own part in, in this, like, I'm not, I'm not a, an innocent. I'm not, and I'm not, I didn't, the, the reason I got to where I am and some of my Indigenous friends did not mm -hmm. was because of the some of the systems that were at play, some of the educational systems, yeah. certainly the, um, you know, the um, justice system and whatnot. And I just, you know, simple things like when I was, we used to have to run through the Hudson's Bay, which is a Canadian institution, you know, yes. to, warm, to warm up when we were going to school. We had to walk to school mm -hmm. and we had to um, to go through the bay. And, you know, you'd get a like three minutes of warm air so you could carry on the rest of the way to school when it was 20, 30, 40 below. But I was never considered somebody who would be stealing lipstick. And my friends, if they were Indigenous, would be immediately suspect because of their their skin color, because of, yeah. you know, and, but I, I didn't really, you know, that's a very simple thing compared to the, you know, the highway of tears and those things. But mm -hmm. I just realized that all of us really need to, as white people, really need to examine um, what, how we got to where we are in our own lives, um, why I can write a book, um, why, you know, doors have opened to me that have not opened to my, my sisters who are Indigenous. And, and then how did I play a part in keeping those doors closed? And, mm -hmm. you know, what is accessible? So really, it's, um, you know, people call this book confessional and um, many things, but it, it really is a, a self-examination. But I want to invite particularly white readers into to, see, to be uncomfortable. There's very uncomfortable moments in this book where I am looking at myself and I'm realizing that I mimicked a lot of the attitudes and the biases that you mentioned that, that were around me. Yeah. And I just I just regurgitated them and and care, perpetuated mm -hmm. the racism that already existed because of the systems that existed. So I therefore am culpable and I want readers to come with me. And I like to call it into a cave of mirrors, like a cave of mirrors. So we can sit and be uncomfortable yeah. and sit with our truth and see ourselves and see ourselves as we really are, that we are part as the mainstream, as the colonial, as the colonists, basically, mm -hmm. we have to see, we have to see because if we don't see and admit that we are culpable, then we can never, ever make change. We, because we have to take our, take our part in it and say, indeed, this is, this is my part. Like, it doesn't have to be a great, you, you know, a great big. I, in fact, I think some of the incidents in the book are very small. Mm 
but they add up to attitudes towards Indigenous people that I'm, I'm, ash I'm, I'm ashamed of now. But I think by admitting them, I have a, I have a, you know, I I can sort of um, move forward in a good way. Yeah. As an, what does it mean to be a true ally of people yeah. who have been oppressed? For generations, and and to recognize that I'm one, I am part of the one of the oppressors. Mm -hmm. You know, where yeah. where does that leave me, and how do we move forward together? Mm -hmm. So those are some of the big questions. But in the cave of mirrors, it's not always a great place to sit, because I don't want people just to see my story. I want them to recognize that their story is similar. Yeah. That that regardless of what small town you grew up in, it doesn't have to be Yellowknife. In the Northwest Territories, it can be Bradford, it can be Scarborough, it can be yeah. Brisbane, Australia. If you have a sense that white in the 60s and 70s, white is somehow superior or better, you really need to look at that, you know? So, it, yeah. Sorry, sorry to cut you short. I I, um, I was just adding to, um, from the book, you we're trying to marry Anne when you and uh, what's the girl's name? I've forgotten. Uh, Carmel. 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 Yeah. You, when it was you and Carmel were trying to make Mary Anne look beautiful. No, oh no, Carmel. it was it was myself and Suze. And Suze. Suze, yes, yeah. Suze, yeah. Suze, yeah. <laughs> to make uh, Mary Anne beautiful. Yeah. It, it, it did resonate with me, and this is where it resonated with me that when you were doing that unconsciously you were putting white as the standard you know you do this you do this you become nice yeah. and white like a porcelain doll and then that is beauty yeah and I, i'm going to relate it to what is going on in many parts of the world when it comes to bleaching skin bleaching mm. yes so in many of the developing parts of the world, maybe Jamaica, the continent of Africa, or um, even in India, the fairer your skin is, the more beautiful you are. And that is from that concept of white is the standard of beauty. So you do get even the darkest sooth, like I'm dark, but you do get darker than me bleaching to become white like you which is not possible <laughs> but i mean really look at us i'm actually very red I'm red <laughs> and you know you're i mean and each of us have our beauty you know our beauty is uh our beauty is very much our beauty of our our hearts and our our, our, our thinking and our yes. spirits yeah yes. so i'm not actually white i'm really quite red my skin is very red um, but it's, it's, yeah, that, that scene. I'm um, laughing, but it's not funny, but yeah. it's just a whole, um, I think the way I'm saying it, it sounded ridiculous to me. <laughs> <laughs> That's why <laughs> I, I am laughing. And also you say, you know, why do you read? <laughs> we, we've assigned, <laughs> we've assigned all these colors to ourselves <laughs> to define yeah yeah but at the end of the day it's um like i told i i do precept train so the last 12 weeks of every nurse's life um i'm one of the nurses that do the training so i just finished one and my young lady is a i don't even know what to say fairer with silky hair <laughs> yeah yeah than me so this is so i i've been reading it at work and they've been asking me so this is one a book i tasked her to read well thank you yes because the nuances of the book they're not taught in school and also to do self-reflection which this memoir digs deep into at the end of the day the difference this is what i tell tell it the difference between a a skilled good nurse and a great nurse who is also a great human being is engaging in self-reflection yeah unpacking your biases 
getting to know who you are at the core. When you do that, whoever walks into the unit that you're taking care of, you are mindful so that you don't impose what you think is right on them, but you negotiate and meet them at the intersection whereby there is dignity, there is respect for both parties involved. Yeah. So, yes, I, I think whoever that comes across. Yeah, yeah listen, listening, listen. listening. Listen. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. everybody has a story. Everybody has a story, yeah. But um, we often, we often don't want to hear people's stories. We want to brush them, es especially sometimes we as nurses are bad at that. <laughs> but I'm, I, I love stories, so I like to listen. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, th there was a part in the book that you talk about which re it did really hit me and that part was um when uh one of the girls was being oh i forgot i've just forgotten the name i didn't write her name down so one of the uh girls was being you know introduced to christianity uh yeah yes christianity yeah. And yeah. then I'd be pregnant and then drunk and all those things. And it, when you talked about the highway of tears, it, it did hit me really. Uh, some of these experiences that um, they, they went through. Did you, in your girlhood consciousness, because this is coming from, from a young girl's consciousness, but as you've matured or grown, when you reflect back, Aside from this instance, were there other instances that you saw? And what made you try to fight? Because you tried. To fight. Um, uh, not fight as in physical fight, but to advocate, to stand in. You know, oh, right? yeah. Yeah. Um, that, that I had a brush with fundamentalism when I was quite young, you know, and it, it, um, it's a, uh, a religion that is it, the religion was very fear-based like if you don't do this this and this you will go to hell or you are not a good christian or you you know you have to save souls for jesus and it you know it was um it was uh it, it, i sort of th there was a a part of me that realized that loving loving somebody isn't telling them what to do or again it's listening compassionately and so in that um in that story of kalak and um yeah, kalak. kalak yeah she's inuk so from the eastern arctic and mm -hmm. you know she's being basically victimized by mm -hmm. uh, a christian zealous fundamentalist christian minister yeah. and um so um and you know i i I will, I need to admit that I was part of that organization for a while when I was sorting out my own mm. experiences of what I understood as a faith community. Mm. And I ultimately rejected that community because it was fear-based rather than love-based. Yeah. And But I think it's a huge part of the colonization of the North, particularly the missionary era, when the missionaries came back and they didn't listen to indigenous ceremony they didn't listen to indigenous teachings they just superimposed their own um christian mandate on top of people so i wanted to present my younger self the mm -hmm. character whom the book is about me as hearing it understanding it from both sides understanding the sort of edict of the fundamentalism saying you must do this you must accept jesus as your savior or you will burn in hell mm -hmm. and then also protesting against that because of my own liberal quite progressive upbringing because i had quite even though my parents were part of the colonial system they were quite progressive and quite liberal people so it's that um push pull um that happens when you're you know meditating upon or reflecting upon um the the christian missionary and 
the um, the girl, the thing that made me want to protect the girl is uh, the young Inuk girl is because she had her own system of belief. Yeah. And this older man whom I was aligned with yet not aligned with was forcing his belief system and totally dismissing hers with no listening, with no compassion, simply bulldozing and dismissing hers. And I think it's very indicative of the um, the missionary era in, I mean, once I started really listening to the um, laws of the Dene people, yeah. they are so beautiful. They are share what you have, mm -hmm. um, respect your elders, yes. sleep at night, work in the day, be polite, yeah. be as happy as you can. You know, they're just these beautiful laws that are actually a reflection of of any religion like Islam and, and Christianity and, mm -hmm. you know, our great leaders that have risen up as prophets, they are mm -hmm. endorsing these same edicts of respect, yeah. honor, love, love, love. And so um, the, the young girl, and I think I was 14 when I was involved in the fundamentalist movement, is sort of a struggling with, um, the, the fear-based doctrine mm -hmm. versus the love-based um, way that she feels is the right way to live. So, you know, it represents, uh, and the reason you say she fights, she rears up, she tries to protect the girl yeah. is because I think in some deep way we can be convicted of when we do things wrong, like that sleepover, mm -hmm. you know, that tent where they're trying to make the girl more white. I yeah. mean, it that has played on my consciousness for 50 years now oh, because wow. oh yeah because it was a re, it really happened and like these are i didn't this is not a fiction it's it's my life and yeah. um you know the fact that i could believe that that i could make her more beautiful by making her look more like me i mean what kind of ego is involved in that you know, you ask yourself, but where did those ideas come yes, from? from yeah. yeah, where did they come from? And that's really critical. Yes. And that's what this book examines. It doesn't tell the reader what to do. It just looks at um, sort of the pillars of the, colo the colonizing um, society. And what are those pillars? And how do we how do we start to dismantle some of that thinking? So, yes. yeah, that's that was... But it's a, it, it, that missionary thing and that um, fear-based fundamentalism was really prevalent in the North. And mm -hmm. there was a time that it was, I mean, I still have a very strong faith relationship, but it is yeah. not evangelical and it is not fundamental whatsoever. So I think from your book, what I got more was a, 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 a spiritual sense and a grounding or I got more of a spiritual sense from you from the book, even as a young child growing up. And um, because the things that where you were aligning and the things that you were doing weren't normally what young, the other girls were doing. Yeah. You were rather in tune with nature. But th that dead horse, horse's head almost gave me nightmares. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty bad, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> the the description bad. was on point. Thank Not you. Not to say, I also fell in love with Lawrence. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody does. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know where he is. I've never found him. No, I've never found him. So, um, you know, I, I, I think I should also explain to your listeners that the book is um, it, the narrator is an unreliable narrator. It's a young narrator, yes. very young from the age of three to the age of 17. So the narrator is unreliable right from the beginning. And because it's me and because I had a lot of fantasy, because growing up with no television, no Internet, you know, just really relying on my imagination. Yeah. yeah, and my brothers and, you know, my sister and just sort of playing a lot of games that were active imagination and not having the influences of um, the outside world. Um, I was a very, um, 
I had the um, propensity to um, imagine a lot. Mm -hmm. And I lived in a world that was perhaps not very realistic. You know, it was like a world where um, I could make things better if I tried. Like I could always make it better than it was. So a lot of the romantic part of the relationship, the love relationship with Lawrence, who's um, Indigenous, uh, Dene, um, he's a real person. Um, he, but I think that a lot of the um, longing in the book and the yearning is the machinations of a fairly young and uh, and to be fair a, 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 a okay. teenager but also a teenager with no parents my parents mm -hmm. had left mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so i didn't have the reality of you know my day-to-day -day life because my yes. parents had moved and left me in the territories um yes. for that time so yeah yeah um and you talk about belonging yeah page 162 i have a quote here give me one second and th this is also about lawrence and the belonging I i'm sorry i got stuck with lawrence <laughs> he also became my love interest <laughs> yeah well yeah <laughs> The encounter with Lawrence out on Long Lake in November 1971 was my re first real contact with someone outside my safe circle of family and friends. He didn't belong in the circle. I knew that. But what I didn't recognize was his not belonging was based on race. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, wow. Yeah, that's pretty hard, isn't it? It is. Yeah. It is. It is. Yeah. It's um before we continue, well um I, I, I will encourage, I'll highly encourage um people around the world, whoever that is watching, people that watch to get copies of Tracking the Caribou Queen, Memo of a Settler Girlhood by um margaret mcpherson it's on amazon i got mine on amazon so you can get your copy on amazon and if you've not subscribed to this channel please do so um about 80 percent that watch the show have not yet subscribed so i am hoping that more people will subscribe so that we can get more you know stories that are shared that are inspirational transformational that are also educational this is a settler girlhood narrative here in canada but it is also like margaret earlier said it applies to any part of the world which has had contact with you know uh, colonization this book is also about decolonizing you know decolonizing the mind which many of us need to because colonization has created its biases between and amongst us as human beings decolonizing our minds and getting to the core of what it means to be a human being and the dignity and respect that we need to accord each other and the love we need to give each other yes i believe will help make the world a better place Yes. So that Margaret and I can one day sit and have coffee. <laughs> yeah, I would love that. Yeah. yeah, so please, 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 Tracking the Caribou Queen, it is a beautiful in-depth read. And um, any of my students are going to read this. It doesn't matter that your color, your creed or whatever. I think it is a good read for understanding because you talk about race, you talk about belonging, you talk about a Canadian period that we don't know because we see a different Canada at yeah. this particular moment. And you've yeah. lived through this and you've re reflected to the back um, behind. And I, I think you also call us to reflect on ourselves as individuals as well because i also have my biases 
Yes, we all do. Yes, we all do. And I really appreciate that. I, I think we're, I think as Canadians, we like to think of ourselves in a certain way as polite. And really, we have to really look at the fact that we, at behind us, we have a genocide. We have the residential school system. We have um, appalling treatment of the people who were here long before yeah. um, white people arrived, long, long before, and they welcomed us. We were uninvited guests, and we were welcomed. And we were welcomed. Yeah. And we were welcomed. And yet, what did we do with that welcome? How did we subjugate those same people? I think we have. It just gives me goosebumps when I think about it. Still, we need to. We need to take a hard look at ourselves because we want this idea of Canada, you know, the big melting pot, you know, this cultural mosaic, you know, but what is at our past and what have we done to our own people, our Mm -hmm. indigenous people? And let's set that right. And I think one way to set that right, Nana, is truly to um, do some reflection, do some really deep and hard thinking about um, how to listen and how to stand beside our sisters and our brothers who are Indigenous and make sure, and instead of being the oppressor, why don't we be the person who, you know, is is the person who stands next to them and, and holds them up, yeah. holds them up. Because uh, it, mm-hmm. it it's time. It's yeah. time now. We have to start somewhere. Yes. I, I think I'm going to um, how do we call it um, put it put it another way exactly what you said. It's like somebody invite <clears throat> I invite you to my home, and then you come and take over my home, and then I become a servant in in my own home, and I have no say. Yeah. So, for lack of a better pictorial view, that 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 is what has happened. So. Your your insistence is we have a role to play. We are invited. We were invited onto this land. We were taken care of. So we need to respect, you know, the people that invited us into onto the land, into their homes. And it's very critical. But before we go, uh, before I continue, let me acknowledge um, Alex Boat saying. He says, good evening to you, sis, and your guests, watching you people live from Ghana, and I'm enjoying the program. First time here, and keep it up. Okay. <laughs> Welcome Thank you. to Ghana, Margaret. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yes. What you're saying is critical. It's, it is critical because for those of us coming in, I've been here a quarter of a century this year. I love saying that. Congratulations. A quarter of a century. I recently discovered that I, I, I had just gone to Ghana on uh, to see my family and came back. And on my way there, I realized that, oh, my goodness, in a sea of Black people, I still felt lost. Hmm. I felt lost because I didn't feel like I was home, quote, unquote. Oh, I was going home. So when I came back, I was telling the girls at work that I now feel like I was lost. I didn't feel like I was home, but Canada felt like home. So the sense of home has changed. Yeah. And, I, and it also that I have spent a quarter of a century, all my adult life, university here, children here, work life here, everything here. Ghana has been a quote-unquote vacation place. Hmm. And maybe I've gone to Ghana maybe 18 times in all these two weeks, three weeks, one week. So, of course. But the key for me is that what your book, um, Tracking the Caribou Queen, does for me is that it helps us understand our place here in Canada and also it teaches us that this is what has been done and this is what needs to be undone yes and for me coming in with all those biases that were institutional and everything i went to u of t so downtown you see 
So the, the, whole, the whole idea was, why is it that these people are indigenous? This is their country and they still pour, they drink like the drunken Indian that he said. So that was all that I could see. And that is all that many immigrants see. Yes. We don't see the backstory. We don't get into it. We just right. look at this. Right. Yeah. So sometimes you get me clashing with other immigrant communities or people because all that they see is what I saw first. Mm -hmm. But the history is yeah. always missed. Yeah. And we understand. Trauma. Yeah. We understand the drinking. We understand the lack of parenting. We understand the fact that there's so many indigenous people in the prison systems. If we understand what happened yes. and that their children were taken from them for gener two generations yes. and intergenerational trauma and the idea that the Canadian government wanted to take the Indian out of the Indian. I mean, yeah. It was really a genocide. And when we look at it with those through that lens and we yeah. recognize that, it's then that we can start to heal. And, and, and it's then that we can, we can um, you know, sort of understand where these, the folks are coming from, you know, that are mm -hmm. using, using alcohol as a way to medicate their great, great pain. Yeah. We can understand that. And, and then we can begin to, you know, like there's a lot of resilience in that community and there's an amazing, profound um, resurgence right now of Indigenous voices and telling their stories. And it's very, very important. And but I don't think it's going like we need to. What's the population of Indigenous people? Five percent of the Canadian population. It's very small. So we need those other 95 percent to understand that they too are participants in, in the elevation of this, this amazing um, community of resilience and strength and ceremony and love and respect. And those are the things that, I mean, that's one of the reasons that I wrote this memoir is I wanted to examine it. I wanted to examine it in a very personal way. Yeah. And I want people to also read the book and take their own responsibility. Uh, not one person can solve racism, but one person can, can decolonize their own thinking and they can present it to other people. And it can be like a domino effect where yeah. we, we start to realize that that 95% of the population, both immigrant and white people, all those immigrant people, those are all immigrant people. We're not indigenous to Canada, it doesn't matter where we came from, England or Scotland or Ghana or wherever, we are all, we are all immigrant people and we need to look at um, our true Canadian history and not the great Canadian history we like to, we like to communicate, you know? I mean, there's a lot to, I mean, I'm very proud to be Canadian, yeah. but I do think that there's work involved. We have work to do, we have work yeah. to do and we will do it, we'll yes. do it. And, and um, I, I'm glad you have you you have started your part, and I hope Thank you too. don't stop. Uh, keep keep doing this part of the work, and I will also be doing my part. But a lot of these stories need to be told, you know, from different lenses. And I I am so grateful I came across your book, you know, through that lens of the settler, you know, girl telling her telling her story um well thank you thank you for thank you for like inviting me on, on your show it's such a pleasure to meet you and to be hosted by you and to know that you have subscribers all over the world and we can change things you know we we definitely can change things and yeah. that's one one of the things that for me it, it, it's how do we make the world a better place yes yeah. Yes. What what do I learn that I can also teach? And when I learned about this book, I can only teach it through you coming on and telling us this narrative of experience of you growing up Canadian and um, uh oh, you kind of got lost there. 
sorry, I got a phone call in the middle of things. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. I'm so sorry. your next book, I know you have something cooking. Oh, I do have something cooking. It's um, yeah, it's a different book. It's a collection of short stories. Um, okay. again, it's uh really looking at psychological motivations of people. Um, a lot of the book is set in you. Um, but it's sort of trying to understand why people behave the way they do, like really penetrating the deep psychological motivations of human beings. Now you've and, got me interested. Yeah, thank you. And and and. Uh, helping us to understand that really below the surface, we're all the same, you know, we're all the same. We all have the same desires to, to be, to be heard and to be seen and to be honored. And, and wow. sometimes we, we, and to be loved. Yeah. And sometimes we act badly and you don't really understand why the behavior is this way until you dig deep and you dig deeply into someone's past and you realize that if, you know, they're angry, it's often because they've been hurt. So, so the anger is acted out in later life, but it's because of the hurt and the pain of early life. So I, I use the same characters and I show them at different times in their life. And I'm trying to find a publisher and I'm working to get the book out. Um, it's ready to pretty much ready to go. And I'm excited about it because I think it has a lot of potential to look at the human family. And yeah. the human family and what motivates us is really, really um, what I'm interested in, in, in the world. I would love to read that. Thank you. Yeah. Well, you might have to wait a few years. <laughs> yeah. I, I hope not. I hope not. <laughs> I, I hope not. I, I would love to read that. The reason being uh, recently I've been... Um, it, it, it's not entirely a recent thing, but it, it's one of those questions I've been asking myself why uh, until I came to Canada and this is one thing that if you this, this is a narrative amongst many um, black immigrants until you leave the continent or wherever there's a majority of you and come to North America you never knew the color of your skin was black mm -hmm. the discovery of being black is here in in the West, until we knew we were black people, I had no idea I was black. People. Yeah. <laughs> so right now I find it funny. Actually, I never knew I was black until I got to Canada and discovered that. Oh, so I'm black. <laughs> I'm African Canadian. I am colored. I am. In yeah. the past, they used to call us, you know, Negroes. In the it's like, holy moly. Only one group of people, different classifications are trying to um, yeah. describe who we are. So right now it's just comedic for me. Yes. Yeah. So um, it, it would be very, very, um, how do you call it? Interesting to read that part. And the reason why I'm saying also this is the, um, I, I've been interested in psychology. Actually, I'm Later yeah. this year, I'm, I'm, I'm going to do a certificate in counseling psychology. Oh, wonderful. Like, yeah. Particularly trauma. Yeah. Trauma informs a lot of people. Yes. And trauma in your early life often plays out in your later life. So yes. I'm very look, I'm very interested in um, the psychological motivations of characters. And mm -hmm. um, I think we can learn a lot about ourselves. Yes in my case, I write, to, I, I write to understand my world. And in writing, all these characters are interconnected. So they're all woven together. And um, it forms sort of the mosaic, which is our, our world. I mean, I have about 20 characters that interact and surface and disappear and come back. And they're all different ages and stages of their lives. Mm -hmm. But in this, um, in this uh, inter interconnected short story collection, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to illustrate um, how trauma and um, different things that happen in our childhood don't play out sometimes until we're much older. So, so these things are are really important to deal with. Um, when so that's why it is very I think wonderful to get counseling that you need so that you can have a life full of joy and a life full of love 
and a life that isn't full of regret. You know, you want to be able to um, really take the time to to understand yourself and and decolonize your mind and 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 see yourself as a you know a beautiful child of creator. And I think if we start to see each human being as a gift, you know, as a beautiful child of creator who, you know, is in this world and and crosses our path for a reason, like our paths are crossing now. It's just it. There's a reason that you chose this book. There's a reason that we communicate the way we do. We have the heart for a better world. And uh, I, I like to think that. You know, if we each do our part, then we can build that. Amen to that. Amen to that. Wow. That is the perfect note to end this conversation. Well, thank you very much for having me. Margaret, it has (laughs) been wonderful. Listen, I am looking forward to the next book. Guys, you can follow Margaret on Instagram at writing Margaret. Right. Writing Margaret. Yeah. Writing Margaret. Yeah. Writing Margaret. So when you search Writing Margaret, you can find her very, very easily. And the title of the book is Tracking the Caribou Queen. It is packed with so much information. So if you're thinking about decolonizing the mind, this book, that, this book does that. If you're thinking about spirituality, you will get it from there. If you're thinking about love, you will get it from there. If you're looking to see Canada through a, a, a young girl's you know, um, perspective growing up in the 70s, I think she opens the door that many of us haven't had the opportunity to see or walk through. So I highly recommend you take a look at that. And just that sense of reflection or introspective um, practice for me it is an amazing practice i keep my journal and i put it on because this memory will fade that is the only way i keep stuff fresh and active and i can always go back and see how i have progressed in life so please get your copy it's on amazon and thank you so much margaret and subscribe 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 yeah (laughs) that part i sometimes forget because i get over excited yeah (laughs) well it was a pleasure to meet you and a pleasure to to have some conversation with you i loved it thank you very much you're very welcome you're very welcome so guys we 